I'm John, I'm a luthier here at Sullivan Violins, and I have brought Annie Jacobs Perkins to talk with us about cellos. Annie is a sophomore at USC, University of Southern California, studying with Ralph, Ralph Kirschbaum, and we're going to talk about cellos, cello sound, and what to look for when purchasing a cello. So yeah, my name's Annie. And I'm a very happy customer of Sullivan Violins. I bought my cello about a year and a half ago now. It's a Ray Melanson made in 2006 in Rochester, Massachusetts, right? Yes, Massachusetts. Um, and while I was looking for the cello, it was a very stressful process for me and probably for my parents too, because they're really expensive and you have to be sure that you like it when you buy it. So while I was talking to my friends who aren't musicians at University of Southern California, I realized how confusing the sound language that musicians and luthiers use can be. So I wanted to help explain that a little bit more with John today. So as a musician, um, what are some of the terms that you hear musicians like yourself use to describe cello sound? Some of the most common that I've heard are like whether a cello is dark or bright or whether it's like loud or soft is pretty self-explanatory because those are words that you just use for sound. Um, but when you're talking about a cello that's dark, it usually has a lot of overtones and it's not quieter, but the sound has more complexity to it. Whereas a bright cello is gonna sound more like a trumpet, kind of brassy and like really in your face. Um, one thing that I love about my cello is that it's really sweet. Um, the sound is very pure. There aren't a ton of overtones, which means that um, the cello really rings. And in a big hall, that's what conductors and audience members pick out about my cello is that it's loud, but at the same time, it's not jarring or um, like overly in your face the way a super bright cello would be. I'm going to play a bunch of cellos later. And one of the ones in the shop that Ken Sullivan made, um, the owner of the shop or co-owner of the shop, he, um, it's very growly and woody and I can always, I can feel the deepest sounds happen in my legs while I'm holding the cello, which is great. The reason that I come to Sullivan Violins, I know I've talked to you about this before, but it's because you worked with me to make sure that my instrument is set up so that it gets the best sound that it possibly can. Since like when you get an instrument and you're just trying it for the first time, it might not be what you want it to sound like. And a lot of times that's the setup, not or I learned that it's just the setup and not the instrument itself. I think the setup is what the musician feels basically when they pick up the instrument or pick up the cello. It is the the setup is really the tangible sensation of what they're experiencing as they play the instrument, be it um, the thickness and um, shape of the fingerboard is an integral to what you feel in your left hand as you're playing. That does take into account like string height and, and comfort level. Um, for cellists, especially in like the, any of the thumb position areas, it's really important to be as comfortable as you can up there. It's already pretty hard to play. Um, we spend a lot of time on setup to try to get the most out of the instrument as you poss one possibly can. Um, there's different bridges that we use sometimes. Your bridge, for instance, is a Belgian bridge, which tends to favor volume and um, usually bass overtones a little bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, when, I, when I came in, my cello was super bright. Yes. And when I asked you to like make it a little bit darker, you knew exactly what to do. And even this morning, oh, I yeah. came in and we changed it, or I asked for more on the upper two strings, right? Yeah. And you changed it and you knew what to do, but I have like no concept of uh -huh. that. So what do you do to the sound post too? Well, we did a few things. In this case, the sound post needed to be uh, a little bit closer to the feet of the bridge, um, especially the treble side. So it's gonna favor more of those higher uh, frequencies that you were asking about, get a, a better balance there. Um, another way in which we want, or we make adjustments is if we want a cello to ring more or ring less sometimes. Um, we'll use different tail pieces because they have different weights or different tail guts. Yours is a braided uh, Kevlar. Uh, sometimes we use um, like a synthetic gut which is thicker and has less vibrations that those things can also affect sound and um, and also like what 
overtones are being exposed. One of the most important things to me when I'm playing is comfort. Like if my fingers are falling off the fingerboard, I hope that sometimes it's not just me, but I know you guys have helped me to plane the fingerboard sometimes mm -hmm. and to change the shape of it so that it's more comfortable for me. Yeah, I think that's something that goes into setup uh, definitely when we get instruments um, in, a lot of times we need to actually recarve the fingerboard or plane it to um, a better shape that's going to be more comfortable for the player. Um, also, setup involves working with the player and trying to meet them and find out what their needs are and seeing how we can actualize that on the workbench. So it takes a qualified luthier and a good player to kind of mix worlds together and make the best product we can. And it helps that you're a cellist too, right? <laughs> I, being a cellist and being an active player has certainly informed me as a luthier too, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, it also allows me to think about when we're setting up instruments, you know, I usually have an idea of a sound in my head. Um, and from there we make choices in strings and in bridges and in a few things to get a really good cello sound. Yeah, I've been grateful for your ears many times. So. <laughs> Thanks. At this point, I'm going to have Annie play a selection of our cellos. It's always a pleasure to have her in here playing, and she's going to give you a sampling of instruments and experience some different sound qualities and describe them and what she hears as she plays them. Enjoy. So the first cello that I'm going to play for you is a contemporary German cello made by Heinrich Gill. And this is a workshop instrument. So even Sullivan's student instruments, which is what this one is, are made by hand, but in a workshop, so by many people. So this cello is great for a student instrument. It's growly on the bottom, and it really rings, so I bet you'll be able to hear that. I'm going to play a piece called Julio. You might know it. It's by Mark Summer, and it's bluegrass, and I think that this cello's lower register really is great for the piece.
going to play is another contemporary German cello uh, made in 2012 by Bernd Dimbath. But the difference between the last cello that I played and this one is that this was created by one guy who overlooked the entire process of the instrument make making process um, rather than a bunch of people in kind of an assembly line fashion who did the last one. Um, so this cello, I would say, is a young professional level cello, and it's great. It has a really meaty lower register, and it's very bright. So you'll be able to hear that it's a little bit brassy, and the top register comes out really clearly as well. And I'm going to play Popper's 36th etude. French cello. It was made around 1850, I think, by the family of Barbet in Mircourt, France. And um, when you're buying a cello, you can either pick a contemporary maker or a really old maker. And that's a decision that you have to make. The benefit of an old maker is that the wood has had time to adjust to playing in a way that makes the instrument very resonant and gives it more warmth. Um, you'll be able to hear that this cello is very bright, but at the same time it's warm and it doesn't, it doesn't sound like a trumpet and it's not abrasive, but um, the sound has its own personality and its own character that I think you'll be able to hear. Thank you. 
This cello is so special because it was made by Ken Sullivan, one of the co-owners of this shop. It was finished in January of 2015, so it's brand new. Um, it's modeled after a Go Friller, which was a small build, so it's a small full-size cello. And because of that, the neck length, neck length is about half an inch to a quarter of an inch shorter than it is on the standard full-size cello. Um, and it's amazing how much of a difference that makes when you're playing to how you have to adjust your intima intonation. I don't know if you noticed, but the Barbe, the last cello that I played, was also small on the body, so intonation had to be adjusted on that one too. Um, and John, who you saw earlier, he's helped me so many times find a cello that's right for me and adjust my cello so that it's really comfortable. And this, these two cellos are just examples of how you can find an instrument that's the right shape for you. Um, another thing that's great about this cello, a lot of cellists are looking for a really low, deep, gravelly sound in the C string. I mean, you can probably hear it. I, when I play, I can feel the cello vibrating in my legs, and it's amazing. I feel it in the floor, and I feel it in my feet, and through my entire body. Um, but even though the lower register is so strong, the upper register still have, has a lot of sweetness that people are looking for too. So I'm gonna play Popper's 10th etude and I hope you can hear some of that. These last two cellos are special to me because one belongs to me. I bought it from Sullivan Violins a year and a half ago. It's a Ray Melanson cello made in 2007 in Rochester, Massachusetts. And this cello that I'm holding right now was made in 2012 by Ray Melanson in Rochester, Massachusetts. So both are very similar and I want you to listen for the sound qualities that this one possesses. And then I'm gonna play my cello and you'll hear the same things but it's really interesting because like we talked about before, cellos change as you play them in. And I've played mine a lot in the past year and a half with college auditions and rehearsals and practicing and everything. So the sound that I initially gravitated towards when I came in the shop has grown and it's changed and is even more present in my cello. So when you're buying a cello, you have to keep in mind with com contemporary makers that the sound will change. And even if it sounds great right now, you have to remember that it'll sound even better in a year or two. So I'm gonna play Piotti's Seventh Caprice. <laughs>
cello and I'm going to play the same piece for you that I just played Piotti's seventh caprice and I want you to listen to how the whole cello has opened up it's really easy to play um, it speaks right as I play the note so I don't have to wait and I don't have to work to get a really good sound the second I put my ball on the string so that's exciting and just this piece is really fun so I hope you've learned a little bit at least about sounds and cellos and how Sullivan's can help you find the right instrument for you Thank <laughs> you. 